My fear regarding Jordan Peterson. This is a little strange to talk about, and perhaps it might be totally unrelatable, but as I watched Jordan rise to fame and significance, as a Christian, I sort of had a trepidation, um, some nervousness, perhaps even a fear um, related to this rise and significance. And it's kind of strange to talk about, but I'm going to try to do my best. And I'm going to start with Jung, and I'm going to uh, relate this to C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce and try to explain what, why would the rise of Jordan Peterson kind of make me fearful, or how would I be afraid of that? What would I fear um, as a Christian? So Jung thought it was important for someone to examine their life in terms of narrative. He felt that we were always or often playing roles, are often archetypal roles um, of a, in, in a story. So perhaps uh, you would discover, if you looked at your life this way, that you were actually playing an archetypal uh, character in a tragedy. And if you could know this, then you could change your life in a way uh, that would steer you clear of that tragedy. So what role is Jordan Peterson playing in his life? As I consumed more and more of Jordan Peterson videos, he reminded me of a character in The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. I feared that this man who inspired me and gave me hope for the future of our culture was perhaps living out an archetype found in this story. Check out this quote, Happiness lies in the path of duty. It sounds like it could come right from the mouth of Jordan Peterson, right? And what's wrong with that? Well, if you're not familiar with the story, you may not be familiar with what I'm talking about yet, but I want to make you familiar with it so that you can understand this better. Why would I fear Jordan uh, saying something like happiness lies in the path of duty uh, from this character? Well, I have, I'm, I'm going to read some of the story to you. Um, just want to get a, some points across first. I have less fear now about Jordan playing out this archetype at first, it was maybe an 80-20 split that he, he probably is playing it out. But if you examine the text, which I hope you'll do with me, um, you'll find some startling things that resemble Jordan a lot and some things that just don't quite fit at all. Um, so I hope you stick with this video and examine the passage with me. Um, I'd like to show you more quotes just like that one there, but the way the book is written makes it kind of hard to pull out relevant material because... It's written as sort of a conversation between two uh, spirits uh, at the edge of heaven. In order to understand anything kind of yanked out of there, you'd have to really know the context better than I could explain it to you. And explaining it to you would just, I might as well just read you the, the actual passage uh, and you can see it for yourself in the same amount of time. Um, so what it is, it's about 10 pages, uh, double-spaced, and I'll interject as some relevant material presents itself and give my two cents on that. Um, after reading the relevant passage to you, I'd also like to bring up Dr. Peter Atkins, who recently appeared on the Unbelievable uh, channel on YouTube discussing his atheism as a scientist. Something to think about while you listen to this passage I'm going to read from The Great Divorce is um, how does Jordan's waffling, or his seeming to waffle, on the God question remind you of this character that you're going to encounter here? And before I get into the actual book, The Great Divorce, I think for those who are unfamiliar with it, I'll just give a little, a little context for you. Um, the book is about essentially a journey that a group of people take from hell to heaven. It's a sort of day trip on a bus that flies from the depths of hell, which is described as a sprawling shantytown, to the outer edge of heaven, which is, of course, described in rather paradisical terms. The spirits from hell are very faint and non-material compared to those found in heaven, who seem to have a full-bodied existence. For example, the leaves of grass in heaven seem to pierce the hell-bound spirits' feet, causing them pain. They are not real enough, in quotes, to exist in heaven. The title, The Great Divorce, is a jab at William Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, which I'd like to get into that another time. There's just simply no time to do it 
here. So I will pick up my trusty copy of The Great Divorce because I'm having trouble finding this uh, passage online. Um, it seems they have every other passage except this one, but this is the one we're going to have to look at. Again, this is uh, two spirits talking to each other, one from hell and one is from heaven. I'll try to distinguish them with some character if I can, but I'm not the best at doing that. So it goes on to say, My dear boy, I'm delighted to see you, it was saying to the spirit, who was naked and almost blindingly white. I was talking to your father the other day and wondering where you were. You didn't bring him, said the other. Well, no, he lives a long way from the bus, and to be quite frank, he's been getting a little eccentric lately, a little difficult, losing his grip. He never was prepared to make any great efforts, you know. If you remember, he used to go to sleep when you and I got talking seriously. Ah, Dick, I shall never forget some of our talks. I expect you've changed your views a bit since then. You became rather narrow-minded towards the end of your life. But no doubt you've broadened out again. How do you mean? Well, it's obvious by now, isn't it, that you weren't quite right. Why, my dear boy, you were coming to believe in a literal heaven and hell. And here I'm going to interject um, a literal heaven and hell. So this spirit is sort of taking things figuratively, um, when in reality he's actually experiencing a literal hell, and he's experiencing a literal heaven, seeing his visiting his friend there. And you, you might be reminded of Jordan Peterson um, exposing the biblical narrative on a psychological level, and it might remind you sort of something that's figurative. He's explaining the figurative significance of the metaphor, the metaphorical language, and so forth. But And so that, that's kind of what first brought me to this character. But you, can, you must also remember that Jordan often says, here's the psychological layer and the metaphorical layer and so forth, but these are not the only layers that matter. They're not the only layers that are true. It's just the layer of narrative that he's exploring in those talks at the moment. And that's something that gave me a little bit of comfort when I heard Jordan say those words in that way. And I'll, I'll go on here. But wasn't I right? Oh, in a spiritual sense, to be sure, I still believe in them in that way. I am still, my dear boy, looking for the kingdom but nothing superstitious or mythological. And again, you might say in a spiritual sense, or Jordan might say in a psychological sense. Um, but here again, I have there's sort of a, a half similarity and, and a half not. He says he's still looking for the kingdom, and Jordan just mentioned the kingdom of God um, being a real thing. But then this character says, but nothing superstitious or mythological, whereas Jordan puts great emphasis on the mythological and perhaps even on the supernatural, as he did with his uh, conversation with Matt Dillahunty when he started bringing up uh, the significance of mystical experiences when people took shrooms and how that had an actual physical effect regarding the cessation of smoking. So I think Jordan may be trying to prove a supernatural uh, existence through a material um, experiment. Um, and he, again, uh, places great emphasis on the mythological, whereas this spirit seems to dismiss anything superstitious or mythological. So I'll continue. Excuse me, where do you imagine you've been? Ah, uh, I see. You mean that the gray town with its continual hope of mourning? We must all live by hope, must we not? with its field for indefinite progress, is in a sense heaven, if only we have eyes to see it. That is beautiful. I didn't mean that at all. Is it possible you don't know where you've been? Now that you mention it, I don't think we ever do give it a name. What do you call it? We call it hell. I think this is interesting. Um, you may hear Jordan talk about um, trying to heal people uh, by first na having them name their problem because their problem may be so amorphous and so huge to them in their minds that they can't actually uh, fight it because they don't know exactly what it is and so getting to the specific points and actually giving their problems a name is enough to get them over it and or enough to start them in the process of getting over it and language is significant it, it, it can help you do that 
And here, this, there is significance in, you know, one side, the heavenly side, gives hell a name. It is a thing, it's a place, language is useful enough to describe it and for us to talk about it. Um, it's, it's not just uh, something we can't talk about because of the limits of language. There is no need to be profane, my dear boy. I may not be very orthodox in your sense of that word, but I do feel that these matters ought to be discussed simply and seriously and reverently. Discuss hell reverently? I meant what I said. You have been in hell. Though if you don't go back, you may call it purgatory. Go on, my dear boy, go on. This is so like you. No doubt you'll tell me why, on your view, I was sent there. I'm not angry. But don't you know? You went there because you're an apostate. Are you serious? Perfectly. This is worse than I expected. Do you really think people are penalized for their honest opinions? Even assuming for the sake of argument that those opinions were mistaken, do you really think there are no sins of intellect? There are indeed, Dick. There is hidebound prejudice and intellectual dishonesty and timidity and stagnation, but honest opinions fearlessly followed. They are not sins. I know we used to talk that way. I did it too until the end of my life, when I became what you call narrow. It all turns on what are honest opinions. Mine certainly were. They were not only honest but heroic. I asserted them fearlessly. When the doctrine of the resurrection ceased to commend itself to the critical faculties which God had given me, I openly rejected it. I preached my famous sermon. I defied the whole chapter. I took every risk. What risk? What was all, what was at all likely to come of it except what actually came? Popularity, sales for your books, invitations, and finally a bishopric. I think this is interesting because here you might see uh, Jordan criticized for taking a stand against something in order to drum up sales for his book, to get into fights with journalists and, and so forth in order to drum up sales for his books. When Jordan may say, I'm taking the ethical and righteous stand, others say, eh, maybe you are, but maybe you aren't. Maybe, maybe you're just doing this for book sales. I don't believe that. Um, the way I read Jordan's uh, personality and his character and, and him as a human being, I don't view him as as doing that at all. But I'm aware of it. I'm aware of, of looking at the situation through that lens. And I, I try to, but I just it doesn't seem clear to me that that's what's happening. This is unworthy of you. What are you suggesting? Friend, I'm not suggesting at all. You see, I know now. Let us be frank. Our opinions were not honestly come by. We simply found ourselves in contact with a certain current of ideas and plunged into it because it seemed modern and successful. And here I would say that that to me seems a lot like what Sam Harris did with his whole career. He found a current of ideas that seemed modern and successful, and he helped make it successful, certainly. Um, and now Jordan may be accused of sort of striking his own uh, chord at that. At college, you know, we just started automatically writing the kind of essays that got good marks and saying the kind of things that won applause. And here's where there's something completely different, I think, from Jordan. Because Jordan would not advise uh, a college student to just write things that get good marks, even if it means uh, casting the truth aside. He speaks very firmly and clearly about speaking your truth, speaking the truth as far as you can tell it. Um, because if you don't, you get used to lying and you get used to being weak. And I think Jordan speaks very clearly about this. And it's the opposite of what the spirit is sort of, or, or the, it's what the heavenly spirit accuses or tries to inform the hell, hellbound spirit that he's done. And it's nothing that Jordan has done as far as I can tell. When in our whole lives did we honestly face in solitude the one question on which all turned, whether after all the supernatural might not in fact occur? When did we put up one moment's real resistance to the loss of our faith? If this is meant to be a sketch of the genesis of liberal theology in general, I reply that it is mere libel. Do you suggest that men like, I have nothing to do with any generality? 
nor with any man but you and me. Oh, as you love your own soul, remember. You know that you and I were playing with loaded dice. We didn't want the other to be true. We were afraid of crude salvationism, afraid of a breach with the spirit of the age, afraid of ridicule, afraid above all of real spiritual fears and hopes. And I think this is again something that Jordan's not afraid of. In fact, he, it, you know, he was just thinking about this constantly for what, like, fifteen years, as he wrote Maps of Meaning. That's all he could, he he could uh, think about. I'm far from denying that young men may make mistakes. They may well be influenced by current fashions of thought, but it's not a question of how the opinions are formed. The point is that they were my honest opinions, sincerely expressed. Of course, having allowed oneself to drift unresisting, unpraying, accepting every half-conscious solicitation from our desires, we reached a point where we no longer believed the faith. Just in the same way, a jealous man, drifting and unresisting, reaches a point at which he believes lies about his best friend. A drunkard reaches a point at which, for the moment, he actually believes that another glass will do him no harm. The beliefs are sincere in the sense that they do occur as psychological events in the man's mind. If that's what you mean by sincerity, they are sincere, and so were ours. But errors which are sincere in that sense, are not innocent. You will be justifying the Inquisition in a moment. Why? Because the Middle Ages erred in one direction, does it not? Does it follow that there is no error in the opposite direction? Well, this is extremely interesting, said the Episcopal Ghost. It's a point of view, certainly, it's a point of view. In the meantime, there is no meantime, replied the other. All that is over. We are not playing now. I have been talking of the past, your past and mine, only in order that you may turn from it forever. One wrench and the tooth will be out. You can begin as if nothing had ever gone wrong. White as snow, it's all true, you know. He is in me for you, with that power. And I've come a long journey to meet you. You have seen hell. You're in sight of heaven. Will you even now repent and believe? I'm not sure that I've got the exact point you are trying to make, said the ghost. I'm not trying to make any point, said the spirit. I'm telling you to repent and believe. But, my dear boy, I believe already we may not be perfectly agreed, but you have completely misjudged me if you do not realize that my religion is a very real and very precious thing to me. Very well, said the other, as if changing his plan. Will you believe in me? In what sense? Will you come with me to the mountains? It will hurt at first until your feet are hardened. Reality is harsh to the feet of shadows. But will you come? Well, that is a plan. I am perfectly ready to consider it. Of course, I should require some assurances. I should want to a guarantee that you are taking me to a place where I shall find a wider sphere of usefulness. A scope for the talents that God has given me, and an atmosphere of free inquiry, in short, all that one means by civilization, a uh, spiritual life. No, said the other, I can promise you none of these things. No sphere of usefulness, you are not needed there at all. No scope for your talents, only forgiveness for having perverted them. No atmosphere of inquiry, for I will bring you to the land not of questions, but of answers, and you shall see the face of God. Ah, but we must all interpret those beautiful words in our own way. For me there is no such thing as a final answer. The free wind of inquiry must always continue to blow through the mind, must it not? Prove all things. To travel hopefully is better than to arrive. If that were true, and known to be true, how could anyone travel hopefully? There would be nothing to hope for. But you must feel yourself that there is something stifling about the idea of finality. Stagnation, my dear boy, what is more soul-destroying than stagnation? You think that, because hitherto you have experienced truth 
only with the abstract intellect. I will bring you where you can taste it like honey and be embraced by it as, a, as by a bridegroom. Your thirst shall be quenched. I think this is interesting here, the language he uses. As this was written sort of against Blake, he says uh, that you've experienced truth only with abstract intellect. And I think Blake has a couple of terms, um, the in intellectual understanding and corporeal understanding. And you could sort of think of the corporeal understanding as this understanding of the five senses of your body, bodily understanding. Think of children learning about the world. They put everything in their mouth. They touch everything. They're climbing things. They're falling. They're rolling. They're tumbling. They're feeling the world out. It's very much a bodily understanding of the world. And at some point, a man has to go beyond his corporeal understanding and start developing his intellectual understanding. And Blake railed against abstracting things. He, he wanted to keep the corporeal understanding, but understand it intellectually. And I think there's a tension there, there's an opposition there, but there's also a union. And a lot of these great thinkers like Blake and Fry and um, Carl Jung had this fascination, and Goethe too, the fascination with the opposites. And you'll see it in the Eastern philosophy too with the Tao, um, the yin and the yang. There's this fascination with the opposites in, in their opposition and in their union. And it's the union that I think everybody seems to be seeking is the union of opposites. Anyway, I thought that was just a little bit interesting how he phrased that. So he says, you know, your thirst shall be quenched. Well, really, you know, I'm not aware of a thirst for some ready-made truth, which puts an end to intellectual activity in the way you seem to be describing. Will it leave me the free play of mind? I must insist on that, you know. Free as a man is free to drink while he is drinking. He is not free still to be dry. The ghost seemed to think for a moment. I can make nothing of that idea, it said. Listen, said the white spirit. Once you were a child, once you knew what inquiry was for, there was a time when you asked questions because you wanted answers and were glad when you had found them. Become that child again, even now. Ah, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Have you gone so wrong? Thirst was made for water, inquiry for truth. What you now call the free play of inquiry has neither more nor less to do with the ends for which intelligence was given than masturbation has to do with marriage. If we cannot be reverent, there is at least no need to be obscene. The suggestion that I should return to my age, at my age, to the mere factual inquisitiveness of boyhood, strikes me as a as preposterous. In any case, the question and answer conception of thought only applies to matters of fact. Religious and speculative questions are surely on a different level. Here, I would say, this reminds me of what was going on between Sam Harris and Jordan where Jordan was trying to pull Sam out of this matter-of-fact way of looking at the world and at these types of questions as very binary, yes or no, exist or not exist, and so forth, and onto a higher metaphorical, um, poetical plane. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit, uh, some more. We know nothing of religion here. We think only of Christ. We know nothing of speculation. Come and see. I will bring you to eternal fact the father of all other factood. I think that's kind of interesting. It's kind of, I think it, it belittles what is God, essentially. And uh, Northrop Fry and William Blake commented on this, and, and they took a sort of view that this hellish, hellbound spirit has. And you might see uh, Jordan echoing a little bit. Um, I should object very strongly to describing God as a fact. The supreme value would surely be a less inadequate description. It is hardly, do you not even believe that he exists? Exists? What does existence mean? You will keep on implying some sort of static, ready-made reality which is, so to speak, there, and to which our minds have simply to conform. These great mysteries cannot be approached in that way. If there were such a thing, there is no need to interrupt, my dear boy. Quite frankly, I should not be interested in it it would be of no religious significance. God, for me, is something purely spiritual. 
the spirit of sweetness and light and tolerance and uh, service. Yes, service. We mustn't forget that, you know. Here, I think this is interesting because Jordan brings this up heavily. And Fry did before him and Blake did before him as, as well. And I think they each did it a little bit more metaphorically than Jordan does because I think Jordan, what, what Jordan and Fry and Blake say has value in it as long as you're using it as a lens to seek God. If you're using it as a blinder saying it's just metaphor, it's just a poem, there's no other meaning besides beauty, sweetness, light, and tolerance, that, those good things out there somewhere, um, then it's a blinder. But if you can turn it from a blinder to a lens to see more clearly, then I think there's value in that. And I think that's what Jordan's doing. At least I hope so. From what I could tell, that's what he's doing or trying to do, perhaps. If the thirst of the reason is really dead, said the spirit, and then stopped as though pondering, then suddenly he said, Can you at least still desire happiness? And here I think it's interesting. The heavenly spirit was trying to use reason as hard as he could to reason his way into the hellbound spirit's psyche to get him over to the side of heaven, and he couldn't do it. And so now he's trying the emotional tact. And I think it's telling because C.S. Lewis was very much about reason and reasoning your way to God. I, I mean, from what I could tell, I'm not a C.S. Lewis scholar or anything. But he does seem very, very keen on using reason. Happiness, my dear, said the ghost placidly. Happiness, as you will come to see when you are older, lies in the path of duty. Which reminds me, bless my soul, I'd nearly forgotten. Of course I can't come with you. I have to be back next Friday to read a paper. We have a little theological society down there. Oh yes, there's plenty of intellectual life. Not of a very high quality, perhaps. One notices a certain lack of grip, a certain confusion of mind. That is where I can be of some use to them. There are even regrettable jealousies. I don't know why, but tempers seem less controlled than they used to be. Still, one mustn't expect too much of human nature. I feel I can do a great work among them. But you've never asked me what my paper is about. I'm, talk I'm taking the next... I'm taking the text about growing up to the measure of the stature of Christ and working out an idea which I feel sure you'll be interested in. I'm going to point out how people always forget that Jesus, here the ghost bowed, was a comparatively young man when he died. He would have outgrown some of his earlier views, you know, if he'd lived. As he might have done with a little more tact and patience. I am going to ask my audience to consider what his mature views would have been. A profoundly interesting question. What a difference Christianity might have had if only the founder had reached his full stature. I shall end up by I shall end I shall end up by pointing out how this depend, deepens the significance of the crucifixion. One feels for the first time what a disaster it was, what a tragic waste. And so much promise cut short. Oh, must you be going? Well, so must I. Goodbye, my dear boy. It has been a great pleasure, most stimulating and provocative. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. The ghost nodded its head and beamed on the spirit with a bright, clerical smile and with the best approach to it, to it with or with the best approach to it with such unsubstantial lips could manage and then turned away, humming softly to itself, City of God, how broad and far. So, I hope you can see why I might have been reminded of Jordan Peterson through that character there that was visiting heaven. And there's a sort of back and forth there. I think some of the ideas reflect Jordan's views and some of them don't. And it was enough to remind me and to get me back and read that section of The Great Divorce again. Um, so I'd like to mention a little bit about how I came to Jordan's work, because I think it's, signif it's important. And maybe you could tell me in the comments how you found Jordan Peterson as well. 
I think I stumbled across a video about, uh, quote, a professor who'd had enough of the SJWs. His, mes his message about social justice being sort of a parasitical um, infestation was, was interesting to me. Around that time, I had a friend who was deeply involved in the social justice ideology, and he often would talk to me about all the stuff he was learning in seminary. And I found it curious that something was being added or had to be added to the idea of justice. It was justice. Now there's social justice. What needs to be added for, to justice? Why social? I couldn't figure it out. I, I wasn't steeped in it like he was. So this kind of puzzled me. And, and, he, and interestingly enough, my friend uh, became an ordained minister in the Lutheran Church. And while we were in college, I had given him the cost of discipleship, which I don't know if any of you know that book, but it's a, it's a major work uh, by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer worked against Hitler and was actually executed. I think him and his whole family were executed by Hitler days before his death camp was, um, was liberated. Anyway, so I read The Cost of Discipleship, and I gave it to my friend there, and after he read it that summer, he was uh, pretty sure he was going to go to seminary afterwards. So I, I kind of nudged him in that direction. And so I was sort of responsible in a, in a small way for him ending up in a, a, you know, a prestigious seminary that was actually kind of the birthplace of social justice. And now his mind was kind of getting warped by this idea. And it was I, I felt like, was I somehow responsible for, for this? But how could, this, how could my friend, who, who knew the biblical narrative, get possessed by this ideology which is only a parasite on such a proper narrative? It, it only tells half the story, the destructive side. Wasn't my friend inoculated by his faith in the biblical narrative? He knew the whole truth, after all, the entire story. As I understood Jordan, the social justice ideology piggybacks on the religious narrative. So perhaps maybe he wasn't so much inoculated against ideology, but made more vulnerable to it? I'm, I don't know. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. But over the years, I think I saw more and more what was going on. You see, he didn't learn much of the whole truth while in seminary. Books I had read and reread cover to cover over and over again because of the depth of their truth like Bart's epistle to the Romans he had only read a chapter of I asked him I said you didn't read the whole epistle to the Romans Karl Barth this major theologian you didn't read the whole epistle to the Romans I can understand church dogmatics that's one I never conquered myself although I'd love to but the books are just way too expensive but epistle to the Romans is something you should read cover to cover and reread cover to cover over and over again. And he just didn't do that. He, he was only assigned a chapter, and that's all they covered in his classes. The social justice ideology is powerful, though. You have to understand they do have half their story correct. My personal view of things, my story, it, it's what matters to me, and that's what they emphasize is that your story matters. But it's not for the reasons that they claim. It's not your story is important because of your uh, group identity. My experiences inform me as an individual, not as part of a group. The heroic or divine individual is perhaps the essential piece of the biblical narrative that was missing from my friend's education, oddly enough. Of the millions killed by the Roman Empire, the epitome of group identity, if you think about it, this faceless, nameless kind of force, power over everything. It was a single individual that changed the course of history. As Bart says, it was a crisis in history where the divine being intersected our realm of objects, time, and events. This crisis toppled that great empire as God was known to have done in ages past. This one man who had a name, a face, a life, a death on a cross, a cross that was once, by the way, a symbol of fear and trembling for its death well, now it was a symbol of a suffering God's love for humanity. His story didn't end there at his death. The thing that is just as perhaps important, or even more so, is his resurrection. And this brings me to Jordan's apparent 
waffling on the God questions he's been asked over and over again. I would like to refer you to my short 12-minute video. Uh, I think it's something like Jordan and the God question um, for an in-depth discussion of why he answers that question the way he does. And I refer to a source that he used to write Maps of Meaning as, to, as, my, as evidence to why I believe he does that. But while I'm talking, but while I'm taking solace in some of uh, his recent statements about the kingdom of God, and I understand why he says these things the way he does, I'm still about 20% concerned or fearful that he may turn out to be someone I never should have trusted or placed my hope in to begin with. Like I said in the beginning, this may sound a little bit odd, but as a Christian, to see any academic of any significance take on these forces in the media and the culture more broadly in this fashion like Jordan has, it sort of makes you cheer them on. You want to encourage them to fight the good fight. But all that will be for naught if he doesn't come down on the right side of this God question. It would be like your star player switching teams mid-game. So this scientist in the unbelievable video, Dr. Atkins, he reminds me of some of the more typical atheistic academics, except he was quite open about what I call his epistemological bubble. In college, I wrote a defense of miracles against Hume, and I claimed that Hume sort of had this epistemological bubble, the bubble that sort of filtered out what he could possibly know in his realm of knowing. And he took this bubble wherever he went, Anyway, um, he went so far, if you watch the unbelievable video, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about, and I'll try to cite the specific part right here. He went so far as to claim that he could die, appear before St. Peter at the pearly gates in heaven, and still he would not believe. Now, he would think he's hallucinating, he said, he, and, and later he tried to soften this stance, but you know that that's his true stance. I could just imagine St. Peter talking to this man, Dr. Adkins. Peter Atkins, how fitting, do you hear me? Yes, yes, I, I think I do, uh, but you must be a hallucination. You see, you had time to speak. Now listen, for these words are of your eternal salvation. When you had ears to hear, you did not hear. Now you stand before me with no ears, yet you hear me. You have no eyes. Peter, listen, yet you see. Do you understand? You feel the presence of the eternal fire of creation, the blinding truth of the city of God, and the kingdom of heaven lay before you, and all you can do is willfully blind yourself? I suspect the Creator's greatest miracle is to preach the gospel to those without ears to hear it, until they choose to listen. Listen, for these words are of your eternal salvation. Do you hear my words? Do you understand? This is not an offering to your reason, your reason, your reason. These are words that sink to the bottom. Will you seek after them? Once there in the deeps, you'll find that the bottom sways too. These are my words. These are not my words. This is the night in which all the dams broke, where what was previously solid moved, where the stones turned into serpents and everything living froze. Is this a web of words? If it is, it is a hellish web for those caught in it. There are hellish webs of words, only words, but what are words? Be tentative with words, value them well. Take safe words, words without catches. Do not spin them with one another so that no webs arise, for you are the first who is ensnared in them. For words have meanings, with words you pull up the underworld. Word, the paltriest and the mightiest. In words, the emptiness and the fullness flow together. Hence the word is an image of God. The word is the greatest and the smallest that man created, just as what is created through man is the greatest and the smallest. So if I fall prey to the web of words, I fall prey to the greatest and the smallest. I am at the mercy of the sea, of the inchoate waves that are forever changing place. Their essence is movement, and movement is their order. He who strives against waves is exposed to the arbitrary. The work of men is steady, but it swims upon chaos. 
The striving of men seems like lunacy to him who comes from the sea, but men consider him mad. He who comes from the sea is sick. He can hardly bear the gaze of men. For to him they all seem to be drunk and foolish from sleep-inducing poisons. They want to come to your rescue, and as for accepting help, for sure you would like less of that. <coughs> Rather than swindling your way into their company and being completely like one who has never seen the chaos but only talks about it, for but for him who has seen the chaos there is no more hiding, because he knows that the bottom sways and knows what this swaying means. He has seen the order and the disorder of the endless. He knows the unlawful laws. He knows the seas and can never forget it. The chaos is terrible. Days full of lead, nights full of horror. Listen now, for these words are of your eternal salvation. The rhythm at the bottom of the chaos is its untold order. It's the order you'll only find in madness from being at such depths for such great lengths of time. This ordered chaos is consciousness. It is what allows us to see beauty. Beauty is a terrible and awful thing. It is terrible because it has not been fathomed and never can be fathomed, for God sets us nothing but riddles. Here the boundaries meet, and all contradictions exist side by side. I'm not a cultivated man, dear listener, but I've thought a lot about this. It's terrible what mysteries there are. Too many riddles weigh men down on earth. We must solve them as we can and try to keep dry skin in the water. Beauty! I can't endure the thought that a man of lofty mind and heart begins with the ideal of the Madonna, and ends with the ideal of Sodom. What's still more awful is that a man with the ideal of Sodom in his soul does not renounce the ideal of the Madonna, and his heart may be on fire with that ideal, genuinely on fire, just as in the days of his youth and innocence. Yes, man is broad, too broad indeed. I'd have him narrower. The devil only knows what to make of it. What to the mind is shameful is beauty and nothing else to the heart. Is there beauty in Sodom? Believe me, that for the immense mass of mankind, beauty is found in Sodom. Did you know that secret? The awful thing is that beauty is mysterious as well as terrible. God and the devil are fighting there, and the battlefield is the heart of man. Listen, for these words are of your eternal salvation. Some words are written to be read, and others written to be spoken, and still others to be lived. Those words inscribed on the very heart of man beat, beat like the hammer at the anvil of creation, sounds not made by a judge's gavel, but by a poet eternal with his pen divine on living paper in time. For thousands of years men have tried washing the blood off their hands, yet it was only through washing themselves with the blood of the cross that the sins of man are finally washed away. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold, made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. And they became what they beheld. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. And they came what they beheld. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. And they became what they beheld. Listen, for these words are of your eternal salvation. <laughs>